Good evening and welcome to the Redwood Library in Athenaeum here in Newport, Rhode Island. I'm Patricia Pettit and uh, I'm the communications chief here. Uh, Benedict Lecter, our executive director, is, um, is away this evening. So we're once again pleased to welcome back um, our ever popular music series with Dr. Edward Marquard. And um, we have an, a, a really interesting program tonight. Um, he's going to be presenting the Mass in B minor of Bach's, and it was his final great achievement. So it, this will be a particularly interesting presentation, as they all are, Dr. Marquardt. Um, and we are, as ever, grateful to the Jarzombek family, Mark Jarzombek and Michelle Drum, who so kindly um, present this as sponsors of this series. So it's my pleasure to once again say, Dr. Marquard, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Patricia. It's, a, it's great to be here. Welcome, everyone. And a special welcome to Carolyn DuPont, who started me on this journey almost seven years ago. So I'm glad you're here, Carolyn, and I do miss you. We're going to talk about the great mass in B minor, certainly one of Western music's monuments and a great historical piece, a work of art of any kind. It is one of the most epic journeys in all of music, and it is a setting of the ordinary of the mass, unprecedented in scale, in majesty and sobriety. It takes 24 movements. And you may be interested to know that uh, in 2011, Anthony Tomasini, the chief music critic of the New York Times, did a poll. It took him several months to do this poll because he went through several composers, many composers, and played their works from the piano, from his home, and then took the poll and J.S. Bach came out as the number one composer of all time. As far as the B minor mass is concerned, a performance is an event that's like doing the Beethoven Ninth, the Misa Solemnis, or the Resurrection Symphony of Mahler. And I would recommend to you who would like to know more about Bach, not just about this piece, but about his life and his work, the most recent Bach book, Music in the Castle of Heaven by John Eliot Gardner, the great British conductor. I'd like to start off with a couple of quotes from people um, whom you might find interesting, what they thought of Bach in general and in, of this piece particularly. The first is from Paul Nelson, a composer friend of ours. And this was while he was teaching at Brown University. He wrote a paper called The Composer's View of J.S. Bach. And yet during my years of teaching at Brown University, I occasionally mentioned to students that the single most inspiring performance in which I ever participated was simply as a member of the bass section of one of 20 choruses from Los Angeles to Vienna with which I have sung, namely in a rendition of Johann Sebastian Bach's B minor mass with the chorus Pro Musica in Boston Symphony Hall in 1956. Speaking of Harvard, this is what Archibald T. Davison, the longtime choral director at Harvard, had to say. I do not in the slightest degree believe that great music can, all by itself, exert a beneficent moral influence. But I do know that to sing one of the major choral works of Bach, to live for a space in a musical eloquence that has no superior, to be permitted to share the thoughts of one whose genius knew no limits, to sense that one has played an active role in recreating a timeless work of art, an experience like this, I say, offers us a lasting resource of life and, it, and leaves us at least different beings from what we were before. Helmut Rilling, the great Bach interpreter and German conductor internationally recognized as one of the great Bach conductors says, with the supreme command of vocal and instrumental compositional techniques that he had developed over his lifetime, in the absence of the urgency of an impending performance, Bach was prepared to come face to face with the awesome task of dealing with the central tenets of the Christian faith. And lastly, Albert Einstein, this is what I have to say about Bach. And you may remember that Einstein was a violinist as well as 
a physicist. Listen, play, love, revere, and keep your trap shut. A little background, why a mass? Um, as you know, Bach was, was Lutheran, and the mass in some form, at least what we know as a Misa Brevis, that is the Kyrie and Gloria movements, were permitted in the Lutheran church during Bach's time. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, Bach grew up in Eisenach with a connection to the Georges church there, and that's the same church where Luther went. He went to school and church where Martin Luther did, and he Eisenach is in the shadow of Wartburg, where Luther hid out from 1521 to 1522, and translated the New Testament of the Bible from Greek to German. Bach stated in his Ent, Entzweck, which is his artistic goal at the age of 23, namely to compose a regulated or orderly church music to the glory of God. And this began a lifelong obsession with the pursuit of perfection on Bach's part. He was very self-assured about his artistic talents. <clears throat> and I should mention that not only in the sacred works did Bach dedicate them to the greater glory of God alone, but also in all the secular works. The, um, the suites for orchestra, the Brandenburg Concerti, the piano works, the partitas for cello and violin, and so on. At the beginning of many of his works, he wrote, Yuva Jesu, Jesus help me. He moved to Leipzig, as you may know, in 1723, and there he lived until the end of his life in 1750. In 1722, he applied for a position of music director for the city. Two candidates out of five who applied were offered the position. Both declined, and a town councilman commented, since we can't get the best, we'll have to be satisfied with the mediocre one. His duties in Leipzig were monstrous. He was the head cantor at the Thomas Church and the Nicholas Church. He was in charge of all musical training at the Thomas School, a job he grew to hate. His salary, however, was about 101,000 a year for those duties, so he was not exactly poverty stricken. And he charged extra fees for organ concerts, consulting on organ installations, private lessons, etc. So he was not starving, but keep in mind he had 20 some children to take care of too. During the first three years in Leipzig, he composed a new cantata every week plus four feast days. That's approximately 180 in three years. In addition to that, the St. John Passion was composed and premiered at the Nicholas Church in 1724 on Good Friday, the lost St. Mark Passion in the Thomas Church in 1725. He reworked St. John and presented it in the Thomas Church in 1726, and then the great St. Matthew Passion in 1727, for which he combined both choirs of those churches plus the schoolboys and all the instrumental musicians who were available. Uh, the Passions had been done on Good Friday since medieval times. St. Matthew, and th this is one for those of you who may not have a great deal of patience, takes an hour and 20 minutes before the sermon, that's part one, and nearly two hours after. Of course, there was no internet or Sunday Patriot games to take you home and miss. And the chorales, uh, as we know, were sung by the congregation, much as hymns in our current uh, services are. And by 1729, he began to feel a lack of congregation response to his music. He took over the Collegium Musicum in the town of Leipzig, and they performed in taverns and coffee houses and he wrote much music for them. And he became a Leipzig muse. People consulted him on every sort of thing. And of course, there were the famous squabbles over salary and duties with authorities. A community of belief was breaking down. He got tired of preparing the recalcitrant schoolboys and began giving them old works in the church, either by himself, his sons, or other composers 
and he often didn't list who the composer was. The Mass in B minor was constructed in several ways. To begin with, it began as a Misa Brevis, that is the Kyrie and the Gloria. Uh, there are many of these Misa Brevis around. Uh, you may know the Vivaldi Gloria, which is also categorized, categorized as a Misa Brevis. He composed four shorter Misa Brevis uh, called the Lutheran Masses. The entire Mass was too long, of course, and even the Kyrie and the Gloria in Bach's hand was too long for the Leipzig churches. So he performed it for the first time, this Gloria and Kyrie in Dresden, where his son, uh, William Friedman, had applied for a position. And he prepared this piece for his son's uh, audition for the position. It's unclear whether Bach submitted this surreptitiously under the name of his son or not. This Entzweck or goal and pursuit of perfection occupied his mind for the next 27 years, uh, 17 years with some hiatus. He wanted to leave a lasting monument to all he thought was good of both his works and all the styles available to him. So there are many styles within this one mass, but through his genius, they are all connected. He, he wrote in what we know as the Stile Antico, or the ancient style, which is sort of like Palestrina Motets and so on, or Palestrina Masses, Jasquin Masses, lots of polyphony for chorus. He also wrote in the Stile, Stile Moderno, which was coming out of Italy in the form of opera, and which was the style his sons wrote in, and later this would lead, of course, to the classical period in, in music, which are more treble oriented. And in Bach's case, the big choruses are usually these motet type of works in the Stile Antico, and the solos and duets are usually in the new style. This was a lasting monument to the faith, which was beginning to erode in Leipzig in Bach's day because of the approaching enlightenment. After 1733, there's a hiatus of about 12 years, and we know nothing of what he did during that time, except that movements begin to appear in 1745 at a peace concert at Christmas, and in that particular concert, Cantata 191, which is a reworking of the Gloria, and a Sanctus and Osanna from 1725, and perhaps the Kyrie from 1733 made up this concert. The Credo, Agnus Dei, Benedictus, Benedictus, and Dona Nobis Pacem remained for the last five years of his life, the Agnus Dei being the last vocal work that he composed. If you think of it this way, the chorus is more of a public cry of faith, and the solos and duets a private one. There were eight cantatas, music of which he um, reworked. This is called Parody, Existing Music with New Text. And we'll, when we talk about the Christmas Oratorio in December, we'll see there's a lot of it in that. This is not a violation of copyright laws or it's not frowned upon. A word about parody is that you must improve upon what you stole. In this case, there was not much improving to be done since he studied or since he stole it from himself. I'd like to play the Kyrie for you, start. Um, the mass is, is unique in that is for five voices, generally, as far as the chorus is concerned. Two soprano parts, alto, tenor, and bass. The orchestra for this celebratory piece is the largest orchestra that was available to him, to flutes, to oboes, bassoons, uh, the usual string complement of violins, violas, cellos, bass, harpsichord or organ, and in the case of the celebratory movements here, such as the Gloria, he used timpani and three trumpets which were available to him. Here then is the opening uh, of the Mass in B minor by Johann Sebastian Bach, 
The performers are the English Baroque soloists, the Monteverdi Choir, conducted by John Elliott Gardner. <laughs> I'd like to do that again for you. It's the sinner's cry for help. And what is unique about this opening to this mass is there is no orchestral introduction. It's entirely unique to this particular piece of Bach's. And he starts right away with the five, the uh, five voice chorus, the full orchestra, except for the trumpets and timpani. Once again, and we will move on to the fugal part. <laughs> There's a 25 measure fugal portion here played by only the instruments. And then the chorus joins in and I would like to skip to approximately where the chorus begins. This type of writing and is usually up to the conductor. We call this concertino or concertato. He mixes both the solo performers and then the chorus. Again, the private versus the public. When the bass comes in, it will be choral, and from there on, it's choral. Much more weighty. And it continues for another five minutes or so, whipping itself into a furious ending and, and ending on a B major chord. The tonal center is B minor from the beginning. And as John Elliott Gardner has pointed out, the participants are chastened but not browbeaten. And that's from the book, Music in the Castle of Heaven. The next part of the Mass is the Christe Eleison, Christ Have Mercy. And here he sets it in modern style. It's a, a duet for soprano one and two with violins, 
continuo and the aforementioned sopranos. It's almost a love duet. Mm -hmm. rather joyous and based on God's guarantee of mercy through Christ. It's one of the, I think, the sweetest movements in this work. I might add that uh, before we move on, throughout the Mass, every instrument, violin, cello, um, the oboe, the flute, the bassoon, and in one movement, the French horn, all have solo uh, portions for themselves, either as a duet with the uh, another a, a singer or on their own we move to the second Kyrie God have mercy Lord have mercy and here again he returns to the stile antico the old or traditional style of the 16th century as in Palestrina or Jascan in this in the first Kyrie the instruments had for the most part their own um, parts to play. They did not necessarily always double the voice parts. In this particular movement, they do. Uh, it's called con la parte, or with the part. And so it's a more assertive kind of going here, more weighty, less pleading than we heard in the first Curie, more demanding, more Beethoven-like, if you will. <laughs> Notice on the word Lord, Kyrie, it's a bit um, demanding. Ki, ri, e. And then on eleison, have mercy, it becomes a little bit more friendly, a little bit more languid, more legato, and less demanding. Thank you. 
Absolutely mag magnificent. I was telling Patricia before that the last time I conducted this work was approximately four years ago, I believe, and it was at St. Jo Joseph's Church right there in Newport. And my wife, Diana, was one of, of those soloists. We move on to the Gloria, and the end of that Kyrie leads right into this. This is the first appearance now of the trumpets and the timpani and regular oboe. In the first movements, the oboe was what is known as the oboe d'amore. It's lower in pitch and it has a much softer, warmer, rounded sound than the regular oboe, <clears throat> which in some cases, in Handel, for instance, uh, could be used as a martial or a military-like sound. In this particular piece, it's a joyful and wonderful sound of all these instruments together. It's the full orchestra. It's a joyous dance in 3-8 time. And as we know, the Baroque music is based on dance forms by and large. Again, we come across concertato writing that is solo versus tutti or full chorus, one on a part for a while and then the full chorus again. The highest technical demands are placed on both the instruments and the vocal forces. And at one point, the first soprano goes all the way up to a high B natural, which is sort of Puccini realm. And the et in terra pax, when we get to that, and on earth peace, it drops down and becomes much calmer, much milder. And then he, on the word bon, bo, the words bone voluntatis, to men of goodwill, he takes flight on the word voluntatis. This is a magnificent, magnificent piece of music. <laughs> motive of Baroque 
Voluntatis takes flight. The word will, good will. Moving on to the Laudamus Te, we praise thee. Um, I should point out that the Gloria, this movement that we're listening to now, is divided into eight parts. Um, the Gloria, Laudamus Te, Grazia, Sagimus Tibi, and so on, which we will take independently one of the other, uh, one after the other. We now go in the next movement here, um, the laudamus te, we praise thee. We go from the public choral expression now to the private, the gleeful praising in the stile moderna. And again, it's an alto solo with a solo violin, strings, harpsichord. And as I mentioned, every instrument in the orchestra gets a solo part as well in this great work. Here's the laudamus te. <laughs> Should point out also that the pitch is somewhat lower. Mr. Gardner uses Baroque pitch and replicas of period instruments. I think you can tell with all the ornamentation, what we call ornamentation, the extra notes um, that revolve around the melody, both in the violin and in the uh, soprano solo, that it adds a certain exuberance and lightheartedness and absolutely uh, pleasant and wondrous kind of texture to this piece. It's followed by the Grazias Agimus Tibi, <clears throat> we give thanks for thy great glory. And this again is five part chorus, soprano, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. It's in the old style, once again, the stile antico. And the instruments double the voice lines all the way through. This is a case of parody, which I mentioned earlier. It comes from Cantata 29, Wir danken dir Gott, Wir danken dir und verkündigen deinen Wunder. We thank thee and declare thy wonders. The texts are identical, one in German and one in Latin. And in the Baroque world of figural diatonicism, so-called, these florid melismas or running around on faster notes 
on the word gloriam with trumpets and cadences. And we're only going to play part of this movement now because he uses the same music for the Dona Nobis Pachem at the very end of the mass, the very last utterance in this work. And I think that the two are connected and his genius, which knew no bounds, connects them with the text. Gracias agimus tibi, we give thanks for thy great glory. And at the very end of the mass, grant us peace. But I want to play the opening here so that you can, when we get to the, um, the Dona Nobis Pachem, you, you hear the same music. You can hear the resemblance to the old style of Palestrina, I think, here. great glory, you hear them running around on the Banyan Gloria. I promise I'll play the, the whole Dona Nobis so you can hear it. I'm going to move now to the uh, Domine Deus, which is another uh, concertato or solo piece, again, looking ahead to the Rococo and the Baroque era, or the classical era, in writing in the style that his sons would be writing in. This is a canon between the tenor and the soprano. The text is Domine Deus, Domine Fili, uh, Lord God, King of Heaven, the Father Almighty, is what the tenor sings. Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, is what the soprano sings. And then they flip the text around on the second go round. It's a soprano tenor duet with flute solo, muted strings, and what we'd call continual, that is harpsichord or organ, cello, and bass. <laughs> hate to stop any of these movements, as you probably can tell. There's an interesting spot in here, which I wouldn't be able to find, because I want to play the end of this movement, because it leads directly to the Quitoli Specata Mundi, thou who takest away the sins of the world. But there's an interesting place where at Domine Deus, Lord God, Agnus Dei, Lamb of God, Filius Patri, Son of the Father, where all the instruments come together and, and all move at the same time, not like they have been in counterpoint up to this point. Here is the end of this movement leading to the Quitalis. Mm -hmm. 
I should say, it, it sounds as if in normal, uh, the normal pattern of doing things here would be a da capo, which means that we would go back to the beginning and repeat to a certain point. Bach doesn't do that here. He moves it right into the next movement by means of what we call a deceptive cadence. And it is deceptive. Unexpected. <laughs> Continue. This is another example of parody. It's the reworking of the opening chorus of uh, Cantata 246, Behold and See If There Be Any Sorrow, which is a text you might remember from Messiah by Handel. It's the same mood here, and it's a very restrained mood. And the text again is Thou Who Takest Away the Sins of the World. going to talk about the next two movements um, together because one runs into the next. The qui sedes ad dexteram patris, thou who sittest at the right hand of the Father, hear us, hear our prayer, portrays Christ's role as a mediator. There's a sigh motive, such as we heard in the first Kyrie, and an ascending pleading motive again. This is for alto oboe d'amore. Remember, the oboe d'amore is a lower pitched instrument with a much warmer tone and lends greatly to the mood of this particular text. And it strings and again continuo. It seems a bit movie, moving, busy music for uh, sitting, but in, in any case, this is what we have. Several times the oboe, the violin, and the alto come together on, un on unison a unison note, again signifying to Bach three in one. And if you listen to the strange melismas on the sedes or sits, it takes off on flight before the next aria, which I'm going to briefly mention now. It's the quoniam tu solo sanctus, thou alone art holy, Lord Jesus Christ, thou alone art most high. This is a very, very majestic aria 
for the bass or the baritone, and it's for bass solo, uh, obbligato horn part, which is the solo part assigned to the horn, for strings and continuo, and to what John Elliott Gardner calls box humor, there are these two growling uh, bassoons honking along throughout the piece, which I, I think uh, is a bit humorous for something that's supposed to be so noble. The form of the piece, looking ahead, is a polonaise, much as what Liszt and Chopin wrote, however, in a different guise of the Baroque. Here's the Crisades, followed by the Quonion. Over the more. Play the end of that moving into the quoniam and then i'm going to stop in the middle of the the bass aria and move to the end of that because it leads into the finale of this gloria movement the cum sancto spiritu in gloria dei patris with the holy spirit in glory with god the father which again introduces all the instruments of the orchestra including the three trumpets timpani uh, the flutes the oboes the regular oboes and strings, of course. Um, he alternates in this particular movement the uh, groups of instruments, first the winds, then the flute, the, first the flutes, the oboes, then the strings and the voices all coming together. Then he brings them all together before starting a fugue based on the same material. It's, a, it's an absolutely wonderfully marvelous uh, explosion of joy. And you may recall that Wagner called the, the final movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony the apotheosis of the dance. I think that this particular movement could vie quite nicely with that and probably win. I would also suggest that we aren't going to have time to do this whole mass today. And at some future date, I'd like to pick up with the credo, which poses its own particular set of problems problems because it again has as much text as the Gloria, if not more, and Bach worked on that until the end of his life. So from here we're going to go to the Quoniam and then to the Cum Santo Spiritu, and I do want to play for you before we leave uh, in a few minutes the final chorus of the entire Mass, the Dona Nobis Pacem. Here's the Quoniam. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
This is played on a natural horn, that is, no keys. A hunting To the end and then to the cum sanctus. In John Elliott Gardner's words, it races to a foot stomping end. say that's the definition of a joyous ending. Um, I'm going to play the Dona Nobis Patrim from the end of this mass, this great work, and hopefully we can do some more of, of this at a future date. Um, 
I, I just read an interview with Yannick Nige Sagan, who conducted a performance of the Verdi Requiem not long ago. And he said at the end, he saw the choristers and some of the instrumentalists had tears running down their cheeks. And he said, you know, I commend them for that. And I, I'm so happy for them because we're supposed to make other people cry, not do it ourselves. I have never conducted a performance of this piece without coming close to tears at the end of the Dona Nobis Pacem. It's very meaningful, I think, at almost any time. Maybe we'll hear this. There we go. Again, in the old style, Ala Palestrina, Jascana, uh, but with the addition of the instruments, especially the trumpets toward the end, it just brings it off the earth and into the heavens. From the end of the Gloria, for the next 12 years, we don't know what was on his mind. But for the last five years of his life, then, he spent reworking this. His goal to write a perfect piece to the greater glory of God. Thank you very much for coming. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them for a few minutes. Uh, see you next time. We talk about Johannes Brahms' Deutsches Requiem, the German Requiem. Thank you, Dr. Marquard. You're very wonderful, welcome. Wonderful as always. You never disappoint. We very much appreciate it. Thanks loads. Um, thank everybody for coming tonight, and I hope you'll join us for next week's lecture on the 29th. And this is with Meryl Page, and she's the author of a new book called 
Earth Medicine, a field guide, healing in seasons and cycles. And she'll be discussing the book and it explores the rethinking of modern medicine and making alternatives work um, as a way to demystify energy medicine. So check it out on our website and if you're interested, um, please do register and um, we'll see you then. Also, I just want to make mention that we do have a new exhibition here on at the Redwood in the Van Allen Gallery. And it's, um, it's called Sailor's Valentines. And they were um, all made by um, Happy Van Buren. And they're just fascinating um, shell mosaics. It, that's not a great description of them. You have to come and see them for yourself. They're really beautifully, intricately done. So that exhibition is on presently. And uh, I hope you'll come around to see it. Thanks again for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Good night.